Hey everyone, today I'm going to show you how to build any type of application you want using a platform called Bubble.is. Bubble is amazing. It's very powerful. It lets you build um, practically any app uh, without having to code. You don't have to know how to code, how to program anything. I'm going to show you how it works, show you some examples, um, and you can see what um, is possible on this platform. So let's get started. Um, Bubble lets you connect three parts of an application. There's the front end, so everything that your users, your app visitors will see, the design of everything, how it looks, things like that. Uh, with the back end, which is usually your database, so any time you need to save information to your application, um, it will be going into a database that is specifically for your app, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And you can connect those two, the front end, uh, the front end with the back end, using something called workflows. Um, this is basically how you tell Bubble to make things happen in your application. So I'm going to show you a quick example here. I am currently in um, an app editor. Uh, this is I've actually built my own website using Bubble. Um, and you can see here, this is the home page. Uh, and I have some text here. I have an image. I've got some more logos and stuff, more text. And all of this I built using um, drag and drop functionality. I didn't have to code anything about where it was going to be positioned or anything like that. I literally just selected an element from the left over here. There's a whole list of things you can add to your pages. Dropped it on this canvas here. And it's complete, you know, put it wherever you want. What you see is what you get. And if you go over to my actual site, so this would be the URL that my visitors would come to. And what they see is exactly how I've designed it. So here's some testimonials there. If I scroll down a little bit more in the editor, you can see there are the testimonials. So everything appears just as I've designed it um, in the editor. So this is uh, that front end piece. Now, the back end piece would be that database that I was talking about. So you can see on the left here, these are the different uh, parts of your application that you can work with. Um, these first three are those really the main three, the, the front end design, the back end database, and then you connect them using workflows. So the database is where you can custom build uh, how you want to save any information you want. So one really easy example is I have a blog that I built on my site using Bubble, again, without any code. So I've created a um, you know data category to uh, custom save my blog posts exactly how I want. So I can determine, all right, I want to be able to save obviously the body of the blog post, um, you know, an, a featured image, um, some, I, I store comments that people make on the blog post here, uh, a lot of other things, the title, the subtitle, tags, I have the scheduled date that I want it to be published. So this is all stuff that I wanted, um, for my blog post so that they could work, they could be displayed and show exactly how I want. So I created all of these fields specifically for my needs. And if I go over into this other tab here, I can actually view all of the records. It works very much like a spreadsheet actually, where I can view all of my blog posts that have been added to um, my application here. So I can see some of the fields, but I can open this up further and see everything a little bit more detail here. These are all the, the fields that I created custom for my blog post. And this you can do with any type of application, um, whether you're building a job board, uh, you know, you can create uh, data categories for the applications, for the companies that are hiring, for um, in the posts themselves. Uh, if you're building, say you're building a, uh, an e-commerce store, um, here are actually, I've got some examples here uh, to show you what kinds of applications you can actually build using um, this custom structure where you can really build out your own database, you can design whatever you want. And I'll talk about workflows in a moment, but here are some examples. So Asana is a really popular product um, uh, project management uh, application, and they present, you know, lists of to-dos, tasks, 
um, in this board style format. So you can absolutely design an application exactly like this, where it has these little cards. You have a picture of, you know, individual team members. You've got due dates and you section them off by, you know, the stages that these things are in. You can actually completely replicate what you see here. Here's another view um, of Asana uh, viewing the list, not in that um, kind of card format, but more of a traditional list. You've got the check marks to mark them as complete. Um, you also have, they have a calendar feature. You can custom build calendars like this where things are color coded. You've got the titles of everything. They span multiple days. So this is something that you can absolutely build on Bubble. Another example is a popular social, me social media tool, um, Pinterest. So viewing things like this where you've got these different uh, images kind of like a collage here and then clicking into something let's choose one of these here you get extra details about that one image you can have a commenting system you can have a share system where you generate share links um, you can have the ability to save uh, specific items to, um, you know, the, the person who's viewing it, like as their favorites or bookmarks, things like that. Um, you can show, you know, related items when you're viewing the detail page of something. This is all functionality you can create. Pinterest has a powerful search as well. Um, and obviously social media features like friending people, connecting to other people, um, sending them messages, things like that, getting notifications, all of this stuff you can do on Bubble. Um, one final example here real quick is uh, Etsy, which is a popular um, e-commerce type of site where individuals can create their own stores uh, and sell whatever it is they want. Usually it's like crafts and things like that, that they're um, these makers are, are creating. Um, so Etsy has a very powerful search feature too, because they've they've got a lot of different types of stores and people categorize their things and there's lots of different categories that you can search through. But, you know, we are, we're here looking at this one product. Uh, you can do things like this with photo slideshows and viewing, you know, pictures a lot bigger and scrolling through them. You can integrate with payment gateways and create shopping carts um, and actually process transactions. That's definitely possible on Bubble as well. Um, and building out pages like this, you know, with the description, you can have a review system. All of this is 100% possible on Bubble. So, um, and let's, let me show you real quick about the um, workflows, because this is where you tell Bubble how to function, how to do things. I'm going to go over to my contact page. So this is a page where I, you know, give my visitors a few different ways to reach out to me and just kind of help them find stuff that they need. And there is a contact form at the very bottom here to send me an email. So for example, um, all the visitor needs to do is fill out their name, their email, their, their message to me. And these are little inputs here where they can type into it. And then I give them a button. So when they click the button, if I go into workflows here, then I have Bubble um, performing specific tasks. The way that Bubble uh, works is with um, a logic of if this, then that. So if something happens, then something else happens, or then multiple things happen, as you can see here. So if this button, send message, is clicked, then I want to send an email. I want to reset the inputs, which means it just kind of clears it out. And then I want to show a little confirmation message. Everything you can see here, there was no coding required. All visual programming in plain English, I told Bubble exactly what to do. Um, and this is a very simple example, but you can get really complex and do much more elaborate and really sophisticated things um, with these workflows. This is this section is called um, the workflow section. Each one of these um, are different workflows. So uh, you can see I actually have a few other buttons on the page. So depending on what they click, other workflows will trigger. Okay, so again, Bubble is visual programming. It lets you drag and drop all of your design elements. You don't have to code or program anything 
about the way your pages look in your application. Um, as far as the workflows go, in other words, um, uh, what happens in your app, everything is in plain English. It's in an if this, then that type of logic. You do not need to know how to code to, to, do, um, to build an app. You can do everything completely without coding. Um, of course, you can add in extra functionality, more advanced features that um, might have uh, uh, coding involved. That's certainly possible. Bubble isn't limiting you to, um, you know, doing a, non-coded things. If you want to integrate with other advanced features, you certainly can do that too. Um, but in general, whoops, yeah, let me go back here. In general, you can build entire databases, um, full front-end designs, and connect to outside um, services as well without having to code. So that outside service, here's an example where I have my visitors um, they can subscribe to the, my email list. And I use um, a specific emailing software called ConvertKit. Uh, and that's where I manage all of my um, emails. And, uh, you know, that's where if anybody's subscribing, that's where it all gets organized. So people who click on this button, this will trigger a different workflow. And we'll see here. So when this is clicked, then I actually have actions specific to that service, the convert kit service. So this is actually communicating with something that is outside of my application. It's as if I'm communicating with Facebook or Google or just some external thing. You can do that in Bubble. You can have Bubble communicate with other services and really create powerful um, tools uh, within your application. And not only that, but custom tools specifically for what you need. All right, so how is building um, any type of application on, uh, on Bubble, like with, uh, from scratch with custom uh, logic, stuff that you build from a blank canvas, how is that any different from using a, a template? Um, if you're not familiar with Bubble, uh, there is a template marketplace where you can purchase, um, and I think some of them are free too, but you can get templates to use to, uh, as a kind of a jumping point uh, to start with your application so you don't have to build everything completely from scratch. Uh, there, there's, there's a trade-off uh, when you're using templates versus building from scratch. So with a template, you um, are automatically kind of boxed in to the features that the template has. Now, of course, you can um, adjust them, you can change them, you can add to them, you can remove stuff, but that could be extra work, more work than you need. Um, there might be features that uh, you really just don't need at all that the template provides that you're gonna have to spend time removing or just changing. Um, also, the template might not have everything you need. You know, if you're building an app for yourself that is custom to um, your idea, um, and in theory, you know, this your your idea is brand new, and you know, you're doing something uh, that's you're, you want to offer something new, right? A template's not going to have exactly what you want to build. Otherwise, uh, you know, you could just use the template for everything. Um, but it's most likely that you're going to want to customize it, so you might need to add other stuff. Um, and there could be a point where um, you, you may have to hire someone to help you change it, um, customize it, or you'll just have to learn how to customize it on your own. Whereas building an application from scratch, number one, you're building only what you need right from the beginning. No wasted time having to remove stuff or adjust things so that it works for you. You can, um, from the very start, build exactly what you need. Having said that, uh, and, and I usually prefer to build from scratch, but having said that, templates can be awesome tools for learning. You know, everything is already built there and you can study um, how things were designed, how things were uh, programmed in the workflows area and see how things work to just kind of get comfortable um, with what's possible and the different things you can do um, if you just need a little bit of help uh, and, and need some kind of uh, examples. But, um, and so it's a great learning tool, but I, I really do think that building from scratch is gonna be better in the end. So when you're building an application on Bubble, there are some core features and functionality um, that you need to know. And what I'm gonna go over today is show you the features um, and functionality that nearly 
every single type of app, doesn't matter what kind of app you're building, um, will have. Uh, so knowing how to do these things will get you really, really far because um, these are like the core concepts that um, will be the base of practically any type of feature that you want to build into your application so that you can, from there, customize. Um, so this is, these are, these are features that most apps will have. Some examples um, that we're going to go through are user registration, you know, signing people up, um, working with your database. So knowing how to save things to your application, how to edit them, um, and how to search your database. So uh, for example, like uh, the example with Etsy, if I wanted to go on there and find a very specific type of product, I can use a search bar to type in a keyword and then have the page show me relevant results from my database. I don't wanna always see just everything from the database. I wanna show a filtered list. Uh, so that's something that, that applies to just practically anything, um, anytime you're working with lists of anything. Um, and then in general, just how do you display uh, information that is saved in your database? How do you actually show something on the page, um, you know, when a user has typed in a search term in a, in a little search bar there? And a few other things we'll um, also touch on. So. These are, these are the core types of features that are really going to be the foundation for building an application. I'm just going to show you um, just general structures uh, that are required to build an application so you can start to get comfortable with it. All right, so let's start with the first one. We're going to talk about user registration. Um, if you are building an application where um, your users need to sign up so that they have a user account. That way you can have, uh, you can save things specifically for those people, like their first name, their last name, um, their email address, maybe a profile picture or something like that. Um, then you want to, uh, you're going to need to build some kind of a user registration system. And Bubble has, Bubble actually makes it very easy to sign users up at like a minimal level. Um, so we're going to go through how to sign up a user. Uh, we're going to create a simple email form, or it's a, it's a simple like registration form with uh, an email address, a password, a place to confirm your password. And I'll show you that you can you know, add in whatever custom things you want. Um, and then a button to kick it all off and trigger that workflow. So I'm going to switch over to my other app here. So this is a blank app here. So you can see on my page, total blank canvas, nothing going on. Um, I haven't designed anything yet. And also if I switch over to my database, you can see here, I don't have um, any other custom types, uh, the only data type. And again, this is like the categories of your data. Um, I don't have anything other than the user type. This is actually a built-in type that Bubble gives you um, because Bubble assumes that most apps will be uh, signing up users to the application. Uh, so for my user type here, um, Bubble also has a built-in email field. So I know that um, I can already automatically save email addresses. If I want to create a new field like first name so that I can save names to each user and I will say, I will tell Bubble, hey, I'm creating a new field. It's gonna be called first name and this is gonna be a text, okay? So again, you're telling Bubble exactly what you want to happen. Um, so everything is being custom defined by me here, uh, the app builder. And I'll do another one for last name and we'll do one for, um, let's see, date of birth. You can also do, so for date of birth, I'll set this to a date value, uh, but you could do like profile picture, which would be an image value. If you wanted to do um, uh, an address, then you have an address type there, lots of different options. All right, so this is a simple uh, info that I wanna collect whenever my users sign up. So I'll go back to my design page and here's what we'll do. I'm gonna design a very simple form so that users can sign up. Uh, well, let's see, let's first, I'm going to add a text element. So I'm going to select text over here. I'm just clicking on it and dragging it on the page. And I immediately have a text element here. When I double click on it, it pulls up this really great little tool here, which is the property editor. Um, this is where I can um, customize the way any of my elements 
look. Um, so for example, with the text element, I can change what the text actually is. So I can say, sign up to my app. Okay, now this is pretty small, so I wanna change, maybe make it a little bit bigger, center it a little bit. So I'm gonna remove this uh, preset style that Bubble has applied to it and give it my own styling. I'm just gonna scroll down to see these options. So you can see here all the formatting options. I'm gonna center it and click over here, make it a little bit bigger and let's bold. Cool, so now I'm going to right click and I'm gonna center this text horizontally on the page. You can see there are so many options available to me to help me design um, and align everything that I'm placing up on, on this page here. So there's my text just kind of as a title for the user to see. So now I wanna build my form. I'm gonna use um, some inputs. So this type of element will actually allow the user to type into it. And then in the workflows, I can uh, use whatever they type in there as uh, uh, something to save to my database. So again, I'm going to click on this input. I'm just going to drag it on the page about that big, that wide. If I want to change the sizing, I can always modify that like that. Okay, so again, if I double click on this input here, I get the property editor and I get um, different types of options. So depending on what the element is, I'm gonna have different types of properties that I can edit. So this, I'm just gonna change the placeholder so that the user knows what they need to be typing in here. I'm gonna change it to email address. And the content format, this is basically telling Bubble, hey, what is being typed in here? Is it um, a decimal so that Bubble knows this is a number that we can do math with? Um, is it an address so that Bubble knows to, um, uh, you know, find a matching like zip code? And, and we can, you know, if it's an address, we can later do other address things with it, like extracting the city or the state, whatever it might be. Um, Anyway, so there are multiple types of formats here. Uh, email and password have their own specific type because registering a user is part of like a built-in um, credential system that Bubble has. So we're gonna very specifically say email, even though an email address is also a text. Uh, and then I'm gonna copy this. I'm just gonna right click this input, copy, right click, paste. There are also tons of keyboard shortcuts to do that. Um, I can also like hold shift down or what is it? Control. Yeah, control and clicking away also gives me another duplicate of that. So um, Bubble really makes things very, very flexible for you to work through uh, your designs and your builds very quickly and efficiently. So this second input is going to be my password. Okay, so I'll change the content format to password. And then this third one is going to be the confirm password so that we know that the user isn't making a mistake. So we'll give them uh, two fields there. And then I'm going to do a uh, first name and a last name because I have those extra fields. First name, this will be a text and this will be the last name. And as you can see how quickly this um, form is getting built, uh, here we're gonna do the date of birth, date of birth. Let's say, you know, you're building an application that should only be accessible to um, people over the age of 13, then using the date of birth will allow you to check that. Um, so I'm gonna change this type to date so that Bubble can see that this is a date. And I'm gonna add finally a button element here. It's at the very top of my list and do that at the very bottom. Okay, so this will say sign up. Cool, and if I wanted this button to look a little bit differently, um, I can either choose from a couple of bubbles preset styles here. So, um, you know, there's like danger is all red like that, or I can remove the style and change it myself. Um, make it green, something a little bit more pleasant. Um, and I can actually create other styles of my own, which is really, really nice because then it allows you to build a consistent looking application. Once you've created styles, you can start applying them to everything else going forward. Um, but also just, you know, gives you more control over um, your palette in your application. 
Okay, so I have my little form here. So now, and, and in the back end, I have these fields that are ready to accept those type of values. In my uh, app data tab over here, so this is where I construct it. Under app data, I can see the actual user records that have been created. So you can see here, I have six already um, with their email addresses. Now they were created before I added these other fields, so we're not gonna see those there right now, but I'm about to create some um, with these new fields and we'll see them get added to my actual database here. So the thing to do is to connect them with a workflow. So I'm gonna actually, let me go back to the design, open up the property editor of this button, and I can very quickly begin a workflow from this button when the button's clicked by clicking here, start edit workflow. Okay, so when this button is clicked, then I will uh, sign up the user. Now, here is a huge section. I'm only gonna show you, if, uh, you know, a couple actions just throughout this tutorial here, but um, you can see that Bubble lets you do a lot of things um, in your application. And um, the more elements that are on your page, the more plugins you might have installed into your application, Bubble does have a whole plugin marketplace, um, more actions will become available, uh, depending on what it is. It, it, the, it'll only show you what you can do with what you have on your page, um, but you can see that there's a whole bunch of stuff. So under the account list, there's a lot of things I can do with user accounts. I can assign temporary passwords. I can send a password reset email. I can update their email or password. I can log the user out. Um, I can sign them up with a social network. So I can have people actually signing up to my app using their Facebook uh, credentials or some other social network. We're gonna use right now the very basic sign the user up action here. So I'll click on that and here's my first step. Right Again, no programming. I just selected from this list of plain English uh, actions here. Now, Bubble will tell me exactly what it needs, if any, if anything, to uh, run this action. So for this particular action, it's requiring an email address and a password. And I can see actually up here, so you can see that this is highlighted in red, but up here too, we have two issues that showed up. This is the issue checker. I'll talk about this in a little bit, but basically this lets you see um, any problems that might be going on in your app at that moment. Um, if there's stuff that hasn't been filled out properly, it'll help you. So um, email address. So how do I say, hey, Bubble, take whatever was typed into this input and uh, store it in here so that we can save the user with that email. Well, I'll click on this and I immediately have a list of options. Basically, Bubble is saying, all right, where can we find that email address? We need an email here, where can we find it? I can say, hey, there is an input on my page and I've labeled it so I can find it very easily. And I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna take the value of this input. Okay, so now I've created what's called a dynamic expression because I can't anticipate me as the app builder um, what people's email addresses are gonna be. So I'm gonna allow the input to be the value here for this field. Anything that's typed in there is gonna be what I want to go in to this setup here. Same thing for the password. I will put the input passwords value into this, uh, this setting. And then I do want to require a password confirmation. So I'm going to check that box. And then here Bubbles says, okay, where's the confirmation input or where's the confirmation value? And I'll go to that input and insert that there. Right. I have other options too. Like I can have Bubble remember the email address so that when the user comes back, it's going to be pre-filled in there. Um, or I can send uh, or and or I can send uh, an email to confirm uh, that email address. So Bubble will send uh, an email to this email address with a link that the user will have to click on. And when they click on the link, Bubble will mark them as confirmed and you can use that status um, in other in other ways. So for example, they could be, um, they, they might not be able to access a page if they haven't yet confirmed um, their email address. They, you just might, you know, be, you, you can limit features if they haven't confirmed. I'm gonna leave that unchecked for now, but 
um, just a simple workflow to sign up a user with this information. So now what about our other fields? So we also have first name, last name, and date of birth. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the same sign up action and I have an option here to change other fields. So I'll click on that. So now Bubble is saying, all right, which field do you want to update here? I'm gonna do all three. So we'll do date of birth. I'm gonna change another field, first name, and then last name. Okay, and again, I have to provide it with the actual value to save these to these fields. So date of birth will be that input right there, first name. You can see here, uh, by the way, you can see that there are these blue flags that basically allow you to choose between um, typing in something like a static value. So I could type in Maria like that. And that just means that anytime someone signs up, their first name is always going to be Maria because I'm typing in a static value here, but I don't want that to happen. Um, you might want this for other scenarios. This is definitely something that you'll use in other places, the static uh, value. But um, in this case, everything's going to be dynamic. So dynamic data here will be the first name and then last name will be the last names field. And an example of um, uh, when you would use a, a static value is maybe you've got a field called, uh, let's see, uh, user type. Uh, and either someone is an administrator or someone is a customer. And let's say that in your workflow, anyone who signs up is always going to be a customer. So I'm going to add another field here if I go to I, this is a shortcut to create a new field and we'll do type. And this will be just a regular text type here. So I because I'm building it in a specific way and I know that only my customers will be signing up and anybody else like an admin person, maybe I create them manually in the back end here because in the database, I can create manual records if I wanted to. Here's my user form for that. Um, so knowing that only customers will be using the front end form, uh, I can type in a static value of customer and I don't have to do anything dynamic. They don't have to select anything. They don't have to, you know, choose whether they are a customer or an admin. I just know that anyone using this form will be a customer. So this is where a static value will go because it'll always be the same. That's just a quick example, but, um, to show you the difference that you can type in here and or insert um, dynamic values. So let's preview this so that you can see this working here. And once you get really comfortable with um, building stuff and connecting it to your database, this will move so much faster. I mean, normally when you, when you become comfortable, this can happen in like two minutes. You know, you create your fields in your database, you you know, slap the elements onto the page and you program the workflow and you're done. Of course, everything from there might be, might take more time to get the design just right. Uh, if you ever need to modify it later because now you're adding features, certainly this thing will evolve, but um, we can build this sign up form very, very quickly. So here's my form. I'm on the preview of the page. So this is actually what my users would see. Um, and let's fill it out. So let's do Gabby at test.com. We'll do a password of test, confirm test, and we'll do Gabby Roman, and we'll do a date of birth, not my actual one, but let's just do something there. All right, so I'm gonna sign up and see how when I'm hovering over this button, it's changing color. I'm gonna talk about how you make that happen. Uh, if you see that happening and you don't want it to happen, how you can adjust that. Uh, so I will click, we can see it working a little bit. There's a oh, password is not valid. Let's see, test and test. Sign up, password is not valid. Let's check our workflow. I probably did something wrong. So password is password format. Confirm is also that one. Let's go back to here. Oh, I might have a password policy. Yes, I do. So this is a test application where I've previously set up a password policy. This is actually important to cover. So um, Bubble does give you a lot of really great security features. Um, one of them is you have to def you, you can define a password policy and say, hey, you are requiring 
um, certain uh, criteria. So my password policy was set to six characters. I have to have a number, a capital letter. So um, that's why I'm getting that error. So I'm going to actually turn this off so that there is no policy and we will refresh and try it again. And um, there, there are other security features that uh, let you prevent access or, or have to follow a specific flow. I mean, you really can customize a lot here. So we'll do this one more time. Gabby at test, 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 Gabby. All right, now we sign up. Okay, I'm gonna move, move that. That's just a browser extension. Okay, so it went through. And if I go into my database, and I will refresh my user table here. So I can see there is Gabby. Um, let me click on, yeah, there we go. So now we've refreshed with our actual field. So I can see all of the values that I typed in were saved properly. Customer type, first and last name, my date of birth, and my email address, right? So this is something, this concept of designing, you know, a form with inputs and then creating the fields in the back end here so that you can anticipate uh, different values and also organizing them in the way that you want. Um, and then connecting the two with a workflow so that it pulls in and, and maps them to the, the specific areas in your database. This is the bread and butter of Bubble. This is how your app gets built and how it runs. Um, from here, it's just a matter of knowing uh, you know, what inputs to offer, how to make the experience clear for your users and the design, um, what actions are most appropriate for you, what you want to do. Um, not all of your actions are going to be all about creating things in your database. It might be modifying things. It might be showing uh, an alert message on the page. It might be sending an email. Um, might be performing some calculation. There's a lot of different things to do, but at its core, it's if this, then that in every single way. So this was a look at user registration. Um, obviously a lot more that you can do here, but this is something that most apps are gonna need. So you know how to get started there. All right, great. Now let's talk about dynamic pages. So a dynamic page is something that um, will display different information from your application, um, but it's always going to be in the same design, the same layout. Let me show you some examples. Uh, here on Airbnb, which is a marketplace for booking um, apartments and homes. Uh, you know, if you're visiting somewhere, you can book a place to stay. Uh, so here is the search result list for homes in New York. Now, if I go over to this location here, this room, I can see that I am looking at the info for one specific apartment. Okay, so I have all of the um, like amenities, the checkout form here with the specific dates. I can see reviews for this particular place um, and then all of the photos. But take a look at the URL up here. It's airbnb.com forward slash rooms forward slash some ID number. Now this is the ID for this particular um, uh, apartment. Now if I go back to Airbnb and click on another one, so I have these two in here. So this is another one and you can see that it's again airbnb.com forward slash rooms and then some other ID number. Now both of these pages are actually the same page. It's the same page on uh, the, the page is called rooms. But when you append an ID to this, Airbnb knows to go retrieve um, the specific information for this one apartment and load it in. Bubble or Bubble, Airbnb does not have a separate page um, for every single one of their listings. There would be thousands and thousands of pages, right? So let's look at another example here. Indeed is a job board. Um, I'm just on some category here, architecture and engineering. So if I go over to this um, job posting, I can see uh, indeed.com and I have, you know, the, the, the structure of their URL. And if I go to another one, uh, let's do this one here. Okay, so you can see how there's CMP and CMP. That's, this, that's the page that these postings are, are um, being displayed on. But 
obviously the content is very different um, because they're different posts. Um, Indeed does not have a separate page for every single one of its job posts. Again, there are thousands of them. Um, these are dynamic pages. We are being led to the same page, but by clicking on, for example, this one versus this one, Indeed knows to send this record, this job post data over to that dynamic page. Um, the same thing for like product hunt. I mean, this is everywhere on, on the internet. Anytime you have like a detail page, um, this is the system that's going to be used. So here product hunt, uh, is, um, um, a site that lets you, uh, find up and coming products on the internet. Uh, people can vote them what they like best. They can comment on them. Uh, usually you can get like, um, early access to things. Very cool, uh, stuff that you can find on here. So I have already clicked into the detail page of this one product here. And I can see that the main, the actual dynamic page is a page called posts, but then here is the unique, um, ID for this particular product. If I go back and click on some other one. I can see again, posts and maze. So another uh, common example that you'll find is user profiles. Um, if you are on any type of application and uh, say a social network like Facebook, and you go into um, to see your friend's profile, you're viewing a dynamic profile page and loading in um, that specific person's information. So Bubble actually has um, a system to create dynamic pages where you can do these dynamic detail pages and not have to actually create multiple pages for the exact same thing. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to my editor here. Let me close all of this to show you how this works. So if I click on the upper left here, you can see that I have, this is my page list. I have a few pages. This is just kind of like a temporary application. So they're kind of random. Um, but what I would do to create a dynamic user profile page is create um, a specific page just for profile, but it's just that one. I do not have to create a page for user A and then a separate page for user B and then a separate for user C. I create one page here. I'm going to show you how to do this. So let me go over to, let's say I'm going to create first um, a search page. Okay, now I will get into um, how I'm building this a little bit more uh, specifically in, in a few moments, but for, for, the, for this example, I'm just gonna real quick build a list here so that I can see all of my available users because from there I want to select one and then go to their profile page, right? So um, right here, I'm using an element that lets me display a list. It's called the repeating group. So I want to display a list of users and my source is I'm going to use another dynamic expression here to have bubble find all of my users in my database. So the expression is to do a search for users. It's the only data type I have. So if I had other things like search for job posts or search for um, invoices, you know, these would be categories that I would create separately in my database. Uh, database. If I had those in here, then it would offer that as an option, but I don't have them right now. So search for users, and then let's have a text element inside of this repeating group. You can see how it repeats there. It's gonna show up for every user in this list. And then this text, I'll want it to display some dynamic info because I want it to show different items for every user. For example, the current sales users uh, email address. All right, so then I can add a button here and this button will say view profile. Great. Now, when I click on this button, well, actually, let me just show you what this looks like at this stage before I even move forward. Okay, so here is my list of users. You can see how it dynamically changed every email because every cell represents a different, every, um, every row here represents a different user. And because I set the the text here to be a dynamic expression to show the current cells users email, it's going to be different for every cell. Okay, so now I have this button. 
and I want it to take me to the profile page. Let's go look at my profile page. I'm going to see if I'm going to redo this or yeah, this is, this was used in a previous tutorial. So I'm going to remove it and I'm going to create a new one so that you can watch me do this from scratch. So I'm going to create a new page again called profile. You can also clone pages from other ones that already exist. I'm going to create a blank one. So here's my blank profile page. So from my search page there with my list, I want to click that button and be taken to that user's profile. They're all going to be taken to profile, but we're going to send data to this page for that specific user. So the first thing I need to do before I can do that is this page profile needs to be um, defined as a user page. It's basically telling Bubble what kind of data are we sending here? Is it a company? Is it an invoice? Is it a, a notification? Is it any other type of data? Um, it's got to be one if you're going to pass data to it. So I'm going to select user. Again, if you had other data types, they would all show there as an option. I'm going to select user here. So now on this page, I can pull information about that user that was sent to it. As an example, I'm going to add a text here and we're going to make it real big. So I'm going to change the style so that it's a big title here. Okay. And we're going to center that. All right. So this text, the dynamic expression is going to be the current page users uh, email. Okay. Now, if you noticed, there was another option for current user that is different. And I'm, I'm actually happy that I'm using user as an example here because it'll be more um, obvious if you're creating a dynamic page for anything other than a user, like a job post or a company or something uh, like a company detail page. Uh, but the difference here is the current user refers to the logged in person, the person who's actually engaging with the page. So if I'm clicking around and I want to view other people's profiles, I am considered the current user, right? The visitor of the page. The current page user is referring to the person whose page this is about. And the content that we're reading um, is about that specific person. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, the difference between the two. Um, if, if you're working with any other type, like if this was a job post detail page, then you would still see current user because that's just referring to the logged in person, but then you would see current page job post. Okay, because that's the type of dynamic data that is being passed to this page. So I'm going to leave it on current pages, users email. All right, so now we have our profile page set up ready to receive and display that information. And on our search page, we have our list to choose from ready to take an action. So how do we connect the two with the workflow? That's usually going to be your connecting piece. So from my view profile button, I'm going to click on the start edit workflow here so that bubble can get me started. When this button is clicked, then I want something to happen. What do I want to happen? First, I want the current user, the logged in user. Actually, the current user doesn't have to be the logged in user, by the way. It can also be an, a logged out user. Current user really just refers to the, the, the visitor of the page. Whether they are logged in or logged out, they are, it's, it's their session, their user session. Okay, so anyways, um, when that button is clicked, we want to navigate this user to another page. So I'll go to the navigation actions select go to page and the destination will be my profile page. Okay. We're going from search to profile. Now bubble says, Hey, you have set up the profile page to receive user data. Whose user data do you want to send to this page? This is where I select the current sales user. Okay. So if I click in cell one, it's going to pass the user of cell one over to that page. If I click in cell three, it'll select or it'll send cell three's user over. So I will show you what happens. We'll refresh the page. So if I click in here, view profile for Phoebe, the user Phoebe, and you'll see we're going to be taken over to the profile page and look at that. Phoebe's email is up here. Okay. You can also see that 
her unique ID. This is a uh, an ID that Bubble actually um, generates for every single record in your database, regard your database, regardless of what type they are, whether it's a company, an invoice, a, um, a job post, a you know shopping cart order line item, whatever it might be, everything gets a unique ID, um, which is very helpful because you can use that in other areas to like help filter things. So if I go back to my previous page and click on Monica's button. I am taken again to the same page, but here is Monica's email. So I didn't have to create two separate pages for each. So the purpose of the dynamic page is so that you can actually design this whole profile page or detail page, however you want to see it, um, to have it kind of like a template sort of um, for yourself. So you design it so that the picture is always over here in the corner, the name, the title is always up at the top, um, stuff below is always centered and they're displayed in a certain way, but the data itself will fill in all of those elements dynamically based on the information that you send to the page. So hopefully that makes sense. It's a very, very popular um, feature and concept that you'll want to understand early on when you're building an app on Bubble, but it allows you to build any kind of thing where you have um, a large database of items that all need to be displayed in the same way. All right, so that's our dynamic pages. Now let's talk a little bit more about the database. Okay, so the database is where you save stuff. Um, so up until now, you uh, we've been working with users. So anytime your users sign up to the application, you are creating user records. Um, if you're building a uh, let's say you're building a um, project management application, then you could create other data types such as projects, um, tasks, activity, like if you wanted to do uh, like an activity feed, anytime something happens or changes, you could create a data type to log all of those changes. Um, uh, notifications, you could create a data type for clients if you're building a project management app where you manage multiple clients so everything gets its own table and the best way really is to compare it to a spreadsheet if you're not totally comfortable or don't really have much experience building databases or working with databases in general um, hopefully you're, you're familiar somewhat with spreadsheets because they work very very similarly and, and um, i'm going to show you kind of how to translate uh, a spreadsheet over to how Bubble um, organizes everything. Now, the, the database, why do you even need it? This is where you save everything. So if you have anything that's dynamic, and usually if you're building an application, you are going to have dynamic information, then that needs to be stored to your application's database so that when your users are then engaging and using the app, um, Bubble can know to go retrieve that data and then display it on the page. Uh, and the database is really, really powerful, uh, very flexible feature that lets you custom structure your database um, however you want. It, it's, so, it's so blank canvas and, and it can be a little overwhelming because you don't really know where to start. But um, the, the, the trade-off is really that you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and I would suggest to start small, um, start with what you know you need. As you start to build your application more, you might go back to it and adjust things. Um, Bubble is super flexible in that way. So let me show you here, if we were to do an example job board application, I'll show you what kinds of data types I would create for the job board. So the first one would be company. This is the hiring company and actually let's call it that. Hiring company is my type, okay? And within the hiring company, I want to be able to store the company's name, which is a text, uh, maybe their uh, headquarters, which could be a, an address. We'll do headquarters location, okay? Um, we can do a logo for the company logo. This would be an image, okay? Uh, I can, maybe filter my companies by whether they're active or not. Perhaps my companies are paying a subscription to use the application. So I can keep my active subscriptions apart from my non-active, uh, my inactive subscriptions uh, with this field here called active, which would be a yes, no. So either they are or they aren't. So that would be another field there. 
Um, and maybe I can do the CEO of the company or just the manager of the company within my application. Now this field, uh, I don't want it to be a text. I don't want it to just be the name of the CEO. I want it to actually be linked to a user in my database. So I'm actually connecting one record of one type with another record of another type. This is the very, very beginnings of creating a relationship uh, or a relational database, if you're at all familiar with databases, but it's just creating links between records. And there's lots of ways to do this. This here, if I do, uh, you can see if I have a field that is a link to one other user thing in my database, then I've created a one-to-one -one relationship between one company and one user. You can do one-to-many relationships as well. I can have uh, maybe a field for uh, employees, right? Which is also gonna be linked to user records, but multiple user records. So I can check this box so that Bubble knows that this will be a link to a list of users like that. Okay, so every hiring company could have relationships with multiple user records. It can also have a relationship with one user record that is different or maybe one of the same here, but it's split out into its own field to uh, identify the CEO. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's one data type. Now let's say we have another data type for um, job post. So these are the actual listings for the jobs that are available that the companies are posting. So we'll do this real quick here. So this will be the title of the position, which will be a text. Um, we can do another field for start date when the position begins. This would be a date. Um, let's see if we had um, category, which would be a text, you know, uh, a way to fill so that you job seekers can filter posts by whatever category it is. Like here's an example um, that Indeed has, uh, let's see if we go back one, I think they had over here. You can see like this, viewing jobs by specific categories. Now, technically what I would do, I'm kind of showing you a very stripped down database structure here, but what I would do with categories is I'd actually create a separate category type so that I can store all of my possible categories um, in its own table. And then each job post could be linked to one of those category records. But it's fine if this is text too. So many different ways to do the same thing. Some are more efficient than others, but um, just to show you an example there. So that's just kind of the beginnings of one. You would maybe have a description field, um, a location field for where the position is. You could have a minimum requirements, what the salary is, all that stuff. Basically everything that you see here uh, and more. I mean, this is obviously one job board's way of doing things, but they have you know all of this information dynamically for the position, you have the job type, whether it's full time or part time, minimum requirements for education and experience, all of that. So you could build that in here. Another type I would create is um, the application type. So anytime a seeker, a job seeker, wants to apply to a post, we would create an application because the application will store data and, and um, information that is unique to that job seeker, which would be a user, um, and a job posting, right? It's a unique relationship that combine, that um, references both things, but then has its own details related to the application. For example, um, the status of the application. Is it still pending? Is it, are they in interviews? Were they accepted? Were they rejected? Um, we can have the, you know, the, interview interview date we wanted the date there of so this application we would definitely want to have links to the company or sorry the the post uh, post someone is messaging me on linkedin uh job post here would be linked to job post and then the applicant would be linked to a user now you might be inclined to also create a field for the company, which you could, you could absolutely do that. But because the job post already has, oh, it would, <laughs> job post needs to have a field for the company. Let me add that there. Okay, so 
so that we can keep job posts organized by companies we know which one they belong to, obviously. So if we're at the application level here, and because we already have a link to the job post, we will kind of by default already know that what company this is for because the job post has a link to the company. When I talk about in a moment displaying this data, I'll show you that we can actually display an application's um, company, the related company, through the job post. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't also create a field for the company as well. Um, some people might see that as a little bit redundant. Um, in some cases, it actually might be helpful to have that redundant field to help bubble with searches and filtering through uh, your records. Uh, again, it completely depends on what you're building. I'm just kind of showing you the different options uh, to, to show you how flexible it is so that you can really build any type of data structure you need for any type of app. So these are just some examples of data types that I would start out with when I'm building a job board app on Bubble. You might come back as you're building and create other ones that might be necessary um, and or adjust the ones that you started out building. But this could certainly grow or it could stay small. Um, now I'm going to just show you real quick. I'm going to compare this to um, a spreadsheet and how this kind of translates over. And you can kind of see here. Um, that the fields I created are the columns of my spreadsheet, right? And every single row is a different record, right? Now I'm going to switch over to a Google sheet real quick, just to show you too, in case you're, you're still not totally seeing it. All right. So I'm loading up this spreadsheet here. So here, let's say, ooh, let me move this over. Oh, it kind of copied me. I'm not really sure how that happened. Let's move that back. Okay, so I'm gonna just try to update the, yeah, well, let me move this. Let's do this. Oh, my little recorder is kind of having trouble here. Well, I'm gonna just copy over some fields so that you can see first name, last name, email. Okay, so this entire sheet here is for the user table only. What I wanted to do is create another sheet within this overall spreadsheet. So I have a completely separate table. Um, let's see if I can do that from here. Probably not. That's okay. Um, and it would have its own columns with its own records. So they're separate tables, but they're in my same overall spreadsheet, which in bubble would just be your same overall database. And you can kind of see like here when I switch between all of them, the different fields are changing because these are for the different data types. And I have my user records under here, but I don't have anything under these yet because I haven't created them. Um, but I could go ahead and manually create um, a company. Let's make it active. We'll do New York, New York. And Bubble should auto when it when the field is a geographic address, it'll kind of auto find addresses for you. Um, the name could be sample company. And the CEO, let's see if it is doing it by email. Yes, it is. So I could search and find the CEO. So if I create a company record there, so here's my first company. I didn't update a logo or upload a logo or add any employees. Uh, but I could. Let's do Monica. We'll add her. We'll add Chandler. Right, so there's two employees there. Okay, and so I have this company record getting started there. Okay, but this is the company table, and this is the user table. They're separate. Um, Hopefully this is starting to translate over when you uh, start building your data structure. It's totally custom. Okay, so that's that's how that works. Um, my comparison to the spreadsheet didn't really work out too well, but that's okay. Um, and this is basically one of the core core features of your application. You certainly want to get comfortable with that, uh, but it really allows you to um, manipulate your data in lots of different ways.
Now displaying data. So now that you've saved your information to the database, how do you spit it back out so that users of your application can actually see stuff? Um, so I've actually started showing you that already a little bit with the dynamic expressions when we created the uh, dynamic profile page. Um, but just to give you a couple more examples in the real world of what this means, um, Google here, this is, sorry about that, this is a, a a uh, detail page for a company um, that, again, it's the, it's the same structure regardless of what company it is. You can see in the URL up here, the actual page is company, um, but I have a logo, I have the name, all of this stuff is displaying dynamically. Also up in the top here in my menu, um, because I'm logged in as a specific user, LinkedIn is going to display my picture and my name and my title here. If somebody else was logged in, it would show their information. Um, you can you see this in any time you need to log in somewhere to some account, you're going to see dynamic expressions everywhere. Um, and in Bubble, you can do the same thing. So I've already shown you a little bit here um, with this profile. Now, if I wanted to display, I'm going to move this down a little bit. The same type of thing uh, to show like my picture and um, uh, my name or just my email address in the corner. Let's say I wanted to build, I'm going to create a group up here in the top, like a little header to my page. So this will be, we'll just make it some color like that. Uh, and then I'm going to add another text to inside of the group. The group element is also very powerful. It lets you move things around um, as a group of things, um, but it also has a lot of really powerful data properties too. So a dynamic expression, let me make this white here. There we go. Dynamic expression I could use here would be for example, current users email address. Like this is my email address, the person who's logged in. I could have it in the corner there so that they could always see what they are logged in at, uh, under. You know, if maybe this is something if you're, you know, if you've ever visited applications on public computers, sometimes people will stay logged into their uh, accounts accidentally. And so this is a, a nice way to make sure that the user can confirm they are viewing their own account or family members, you know, things like that. Um, so here I'm displaying the current user's email address. And just for fun, I'm going to display some other pieces of dynamic info, such as the current date and time. You have a lot of different options that are not necessarily related to your database, but just kind of in general about your browser, um, about the current page that they're on, things like the width um, and uh, the page URL. Uh, so let me go to current date and time, and we'll preview this page so that you can see what this looks like. Okay, so here's the current date and time when I'm recording this right now, that's the timestamp. Um, and there's my email address. I'm currently logged in as this user. Uh, remember a little while ago, I signed up as this user and Bubble will automatically log you in um, after you've signed up. So uh, that's why we're seeing that email address there. Now, uh, here's where I can also show you the difference between current user and current page user. I'm gonna copy this actually, this entire group. And I'm going to go back over to my profile page and paste that in there. I'm going to leave that here. All right, so I have the same group on this page now. So I'm going to refresh this. <clears throat> now remember, I am logged in as Gabby at test.com. If I click on Ross's profile and take us over to his profile page, you can see here, this is his dynamic page with his info, but I am still Gabby at test.com up here. This is the current user. This is the difference between the logged in person um, and whatever dynamic information is on this page. So you can see that they're different like that. Okay, so the dynamic expressions is, is there's so much to do. Um, there, there's so many options that are available for you. And whenever you see this blue flag here, um, you'll have, 
a list of available options to you. Um, and uh, it really depends on what's available on the page and what's available in the database and also what's compatible with the element. So for example, I am in a text element here. I'm only going to be able to insert expressions that are a text value. Whereas if I use like an image element here, let me turn on these borders so that you can see my elements. I don't have any text here right now. Let's do hello. This is a static value there. Um, so my image element, I can insert a dynamic image. I can also insert a static image so that it's always the same. But a dynamic, maybe it is um, the current user's uh, profile picture, which I do not have one, so it's not going to offer me that option. But if I had, if I typed in, you know, or if I entered first name, um, well, actually, the dynamic image is actually looking for a URL to an image, so this is probably not the great example. I'm trying to show you um, an incompatible type. Let's do another example with the map. That'll probably be a good one here, because the map is going to look for an address. So if we did current user's date of birth, there we go. Bubble is saying, hey, a date is not an address. So uh, it's going to continue allowing me to modify this expression until it finds some address value. Um, because the date of birth will let you manipulate the date to become a number. I mean, you could sort of maybe get like a zip code out of that. So it's sort of an option. Um, Bubble's allowing you to start there, but it's certainly not going to let you end at date of birth. That's why we have this all in red right now. Um, so the dynamic expression is just in general, it really depends on what's available um, around uh, that element or in the workflows because dynamic expressions go in there too. So uh, the most powerful, let me remove this. One of the more powerful expressions that you can use is searching your database. So I showed you a little bit on the uh, search page where we display a list of users. I did a search of all of my users. Um, that expression here to do a search for something, and you can see now I can choose from any one of my data types is probably the most powerful expression here because you can filter your search to show different results um, and modify it to show to show them like in uh, an aggregated way if we're building reports i'll touch on that in a moment um, but creating expressions really takes a little bit of practice but it's so flexible it really allows you to build and display your data in an almost an infinite number of ways, All right? So just wanted to touch on that. Let's go back to our program here. Okay, so I can take you through um, some examples now for actually working with lists and how to filter. So uh, let's do, we already talked about some of this stuff. So let's do uh, the job posts and filtering your list of job posts, right? So indeed.com, I kind of displayed some of those uh, pages there where you can see a list of jobs uh, and click into them to view their dynamic page. Other sites that have this same structure, any kind of like listing site. So Airbnb will list homes that you search for by different um, filters like price, uh, location, things like that. Um, Amazon is huge, has so many different um, like categories and departments. You can see here's an example. We're in the home and kitchen uh, department and I've clicked through to the Amazon home section. I can go into one of these and it will continue to funnel me through all of the different categories because there's this, I mean, this is a massive site. Um, and all of this is being pulled from the, the massive database that Amazon is running off of. But not only that, it's, you know, showing me very customized filtered results uh, because I, as the user, am requesting to view the data in a specific, um, within specific lists to help me find what I'm looking for. So we can do that in Bubble as well. Let me go back to the search page and I'll just move my users over here. We're going to work with a different data type. So I'm going to create some manual job post records. Um, 
so that we can filter very simply by category. So let's do engineer and we'll do post A and I'm gonna leave everything else blank, but just so that we can see some of these come up, we'll do post B, I'll do another engineer job and we'll do two more, post C, Uh, marketing, marketing, that's not how you spell it, like that. And one more, design. Okay, so here are our four posts. Two of them have the same category. This is a super simple example, but, uh, and I mean, you can really customize this and make this way more complex, but just to show you how quickly you can put together a search feature is I have an input here to allow my users to type into it. And I'm gonna have a, another repeating group. Where did it go? Up here. Again, this element lets you view, display back lists of things. Um, and this will be a list of job posts, okay? And the data source will be a search for job post where uh, we'll add a constraint here. Now, I was actually going to do category as my constraint, but I'm going to show you that you can do any field also as a constraint. So it searches everything. Okay, so any field contains, this is my constraint operator here. And I have to say, hey, Bubble, only show me job posts where any field contains whatever they typed into this field. So again, this is going to be an ins a, a dynamic value. Uh, because I cannot anticipate what the users are typing in. So I want it to contain anything that was typed into this input's value. This is input A. Usually you want to label everything so you know exactly what uh, it's for. Usually when you're building your application, things will grow and grow and grow, and you'll have lots of elements, lots of inputs and text. Very important to stay organized by labeling things properly. So let's look at this expression. This list here is going to display any job posts where any field contains the value that was typed in there. That's how we created our filter. Now I'm going to add a text to my cell so I can actually see information about the job post. So here is going to be a dynamic value to display the current cells job posts title uh, and I believe and their category. Like that. Okay, so um, let's do, let's just mix this up a bit. We'll do another one called uh, a really great job A, because I have um, a, a really, let's do a really great uh, design job. because so I have one other post where the category is design, so I'm gonna search the word design, and I want to see both of these posts come up. So we'll do. Uh, so I'll do a different category. Um, uh, let's do. I don't know housing. Okay. So I want to see this this one and this one come up when I search the word design, because um, they're different categories and they're different titles. Now I might run into a case sensitivity issue, in which case I will show you, or I will tell you what to do in that scenario. Let's do, go back to my search page. Okay, so by default, I see all of my posts there. This is the title, like that, and then this is the category. By the way, repeating groups don't always have to be the scroll. You can do um, a no scroll, you can do an infinite scroll, where as you keep scrolling your actual page, right now my page is not tall enough, um, it'll just continue to load more and more items. Um, you also don't, you're not restricted to one row. You can actually create like a card system um, like this. You can definitely, this I would use a repeating group to create this exact feature here um, because you can have multiple columns uh, so that each cell, I mean, it's, it's a still a, a separate item, but your layout of your repeating group can be customized. So if I type in design, there we go, we both got them there, so it's not a case sensitive in this case. The any field constraint, I believe, is not case, case sensitive. Um, the other ones might be. 
uh, like if I did category equals this inputs value. So this was a really quick uh, search feature that we put together. If I do um, engineer, that, there are my two posts that come up with engineer in the category. Uh, if I do just the word post, then I should have all of those except for that last one that I created where it was a really great job or something like that. Um, so very easy to like get something together super, super quickly. But again, this is this the tip of the iceberg with how you can create powerful searches. Um, and searches not only happen in front end elements like this, you can also run searches in your workflows. Um, for example, if you wanted to send an email to a list of people, but a filtered list of people, you would do that within your workflows you, to, to identify that specific list. Um, a lot of other things too. So that's a quick look at, you know, searching your database, so many different features, but uh, a quick look at how that works. Now, uh, let's look at some of the actions a little bit more closely. So your workflows, again, they work off of an if this, then that um, uh, logic. And what you'll be doing the majority of the time is working with your database, creating records in your database, reading or just retrieving so that you can display things uh, out like current user's email that's reading something from your database. Um, updating them, so if, say if the user wants to change their password um, or if the company wants to change their logo, you would be updating records. Um, and of course, deleting. These are basic data functions and modifications. This is something you absolutely will be doing at some point in your app, no matter what type of application you are uh, building. So I've already shown you uh, uh, how to sign up a new user um, using that action, sign up a new user, uh, which creates a user record. But anything other than a user uh, will actually use some other actions. And I'm gonna demonstrate a couple different ways to create, modify, delete, and read uh, records. So let's go to the profile page. And I'm gonna do Actually, let's go back to the search page here. This will be fun. So I'm going to have another input up at the top here to uh, create, oh no, those are users. Let's do a detail page for my job posts. So I'm gonna create a new page called post. Okay, and again, this page is going to be dynamic and the type of content will be job post, right? And um, I'm going to have up at the top the job posts title and we'll make it really big here so that we can see the title. Okay, and below this, I'm going to have some inputs so that let's say that this is a uh, a place to edit the post, you know, so I'll let me actually rename my page so that it is edit post. Again, this structure, what I'm building right now where I'm creating a separate page to edit is one way of doing things. You can you can actually use the same page where you're displaying it to everybody as the edit page. Also, you can actually disable in um, or, you know, create like an edit mode where when you're in edit mode, maybe because you're the admin or the creator of the post, inputs will become available. But if you're not in edit mode or you're someone who does not have access to editing it, they go away and you can't actually change it. So you can have a page function as both. I'm, I'm trying to keep it simple here. So I'm actually creating a whole separate page just for editing. So um, I'm gonna add an input to the page here and another input for this will be the post title and then below it will be the category just to keep things simple and we'll have a button to save save post or we'll do update post to make it clear to you guys update post that this is to modify and we're just going to center it because it will bother me if it's not centered <laughs> and then i will create another button to delete the post 
and then this button will be danger because we want to be careful with that. All right, so I'm going to go back to my search page and I'm going to change the functionality of this input. I'm going to get rid of my constraint here. Okay, so this input is now going to be used to create a new post. Very simple creation. It's really just to um, quickly add something to the database so you can see how workflow is used to add things to the database that are not users because users are their own action. So here is an input that is not being used anywhere now, and I will rename it input new post title. Okay. And this button, create post. Okay, so I'm going to click on this button to start a workflow. When this is clicked, we're going to go to the data actions now to create a new thing. Okay, the new thing is going to be new job post. And I only have an input there for the title, so I'm just going to save the title. Of course, you would want to build out a full form with all of the inputs for all of the other information. And, you know, if you are in this context of building or creating a new job post, a lot of this stuff will already be known and not necessarily need fields for, or inputs for it. So, for example, the company, um, it'll be assumed that the person creating the post is creating it for their company. So the company could equal something like current users company if you have a field under the user to tie them to a company. You don't necessarily have to have an input on the page for them to enter in their own company every single time. Um, and uh, just a quick note, there are built-in fields too for every single record. Bubble will always give you a creation date, a modify date, which is the last time the record was changed, and um, the creator of the record. Those will be always tied to the record. You don't have to create separate fields for that. So the title is going to be the value of this input, input new post titles value, okay? And then what I'm gonna do right from here is, well, let's, yeah, I'll just leave that there. I'm gonna, after this, I will reset the inputs. This is just to clear the input so it goes blank after I've created the post. Once I do that, I'm gonna see it appear in my list here, okay? And then I'm gonna use the title as my trigger to go to the detail page that I've created, the um, edit post page. Okay, so here I'm going to click on, to start a workflow from clicking on that text. Notice how before I've been using buttons the whole time, but here I, I uh, text is clickable. A lot of the visual elements are clickable and can trigger workflows, not just buttons. So when this is clicked, I'm going to go to the edit post page and the data to send will be the current cells job post. So it works very much like the user profile system. It's a dynamic page. This is how it works. Under the edit post page, um, well, let's, let me preview this so that I can kind of do this in stages here so you can see what I just did. I'll close that. All right, so here are my posts. So here is, we'll do sample post, uh, one, two, three, create post, and at the bottom of my list, there it is, okay? Now you can see my cursor's changing because these texts are now clickable, the, the categories are not. Um, we can actually change this so that when this is hovered, the text will be underlined. I'm actually gonna touch on that in a second. So I'm gonna click on sample post, and I am now being taken over to the edit post page, and I've loaded in this data. Great. So that's creating. That's the first thing. Now let us update the post. So I have these two inputs here. Now what I want to see here is um, I want to be able to edit the post title and edit the post category. Uh, so we'll do title and category. Ideally, you would want to fill in what's currently saved. Right now you can see these are blank, but ideally I would want to see what's already saved for those. So that's what this is here for, initial content. This is like the default. If there's something saved, we'll display it. So for the title, I'm going to insert as the initial content, the current page job posts title. And then the same thing for the category, the current page job posts category. 
Cool. Now I will refresh the page so that you can see what that does. Now I've, when I created the um, post, I only had an input for the title, so I don't actually have a category here. But you can see that it filled it in for me, and I can, since this is an input, I can click to edit it now. But simply, you know, doing that or typing in something else isn't actually going to change it. I need to use a workflow to update it. Um, and I guess I'll say right now, too, there is an option to autosave so that when you type it, it does change it. Uh, that is called auto binding here. There is a feature that lets you do that. But I'm going to show you in a workflow because that is the more fundamental process. So here's my button to update the post. So when I start edit a workflow, we're going to use another data action, make change to thing. It's called thing because Bubble doesn't know what your custom data types are. So make change to thing. What thing are we changing? I want to change the current page job post. This is the overall record for this page. Um, now I'm going to define my changes. So if there's stuff that's saved that I do not want to modify, I do not need to define them here all over again. I only need to define what I'm changing. So I want to change the title as well as the category, because those are the two inputs that I have available on the page right now. So the title will be the value of the title, and the category will be updated to the value of the category. Okay, now since we're here, let's add a little alert message to let me know that the workflow went through, because if you click on this button, that workflow happens in the background. It updates your database. You can't see that happening. Um, well, actually, we're going to see the title change up here, but um, it's really a good idea to give your user really clear feedback that something has happened and that what they did you know, went through. So there's an element here called the alert, and I'm just going to place it next to the button, and I'll type in success like that. Okay, and then after my workflow, this action, the next action is going to be an element action to show that alert message. And if I click on this, you can see that it's there. If I had other alerts, then I would be able to choose from that list. The way the alert message works is that it kind of fades in, it holds for a little bit, and then it fades out. So by default, it's not going to be visible when you first load the page. So let's refresh, and we will see this working. So here is my title, title and input. I don't have a category yet. So let's give it a category of um, design. And we'll do another. Um, different title called updated post 456. Okay, so I'll update. And there you can see the title changed and my message showed. If I go back to the database and refresh my data, then I can see here is my updated post. I'm going to change the title one more time. Changed again, 789. Now notice before I hit update post, this is the post at the very top. We can see it was created by um, category design uh, and created 1244. Mo sorry, modified 1248 because I just updated it. Now, if I update, we change it again. And I'm going to refresh here so that it gives me the latest. You can see now my modified date is one minute later. The title has changed. I've not created another record. I've modified the existing one. Okay, so that's a um, quick look at making a change to something. Um, you really have to have a reference to what it is you're changing. You can do this by doing current page, whatever it is. If this would, if this button was in a repeating group, it, it would give you the option to do to change uh, current cells, whatever it is. Um, you can also do a search for something in your database to go change something random and not, you know, connected to the page that you're on. Um, and it can be anything here. You just have to go identify it specifically with your constraints. Uh, so, you know, do a search for the user where the email address equals, um, you know, Phoebe at test.com or whatever, or enter in some kind of a dynamic uh, value there. So it just depends on who gets updated. Um, and this, this searching and constraint system will let you specifically identify which record in your database you want to update. Um, so very, very powerful action there. And again, that searching lets you uh, find whatever you need.
the delete function, very simple. It, there's a specific action for deleting a thing. It's a, in the data list here, delete thing. You can also uh, delete a list of things if you need. Notice that there's a separate action here for making a change to a list of things. So this one would be, you know, make a change to one job post versus making a change to multiple job posts at the same time. Uh, so delete thing we can do. Let me pull this up. Come on, bubble. You can do it. Looks like it got stuck there. Delete thing. There we go. Okay. Oh, no, it went away again. My uh, property editor went away. Probably need to refresh the editor so that it looks like it glitched a little bit. Um, so when I click on this button, the thing that I want to delete is the current page job post. Now, if I delete it and I'm on this detail page for something that no longer exists, I want to make sure that the user doesn't get stuck on a page that can't doesn't have any data there. It would, it would just kind of be like a blank page. So I want to make sure I navigate the user back to some other page. So I can add an action to go to uh, back to that search page after they've deleted the job post. And I'm going to get rid of this. OK, so let's see that happen. I'll refresh the page. And we'll delete this post. So it's gone and it's taking me back to search. And you can see that is no longer in this list here. OK, so that's a quick look at the create, read, update, delete um, functionality. Uh, we've kind of done a little bit of everything over this whole tutorial so far, but just kind of showing you that um, you know, manipulating your data can happen so many different ways and you can give your users the power to run these actions, to make the changes to your application, really make it interactive. Great. So now let's talk about conditions. Um, conditions allow you to create kind of alternate behaviors. So for example, if the user is logged in and they are um, on a page, then they can stay on the page. If the user is logged out, then maybe they're on a page that they're not supposed to be. And if they're logged out, they get redirected somewhere. I'm going to show you quick that, that alone as an example of a conditional um, workflow. So over here, uh, let's say when the page is loaded, well, Bubble actually has specific ones for this one that I just talked about, but I'm going to show you how to do it in a condition too. Um, there are specific ones for login and log out, but let's say that you have a workflow uh, event for that happens anytime the page is loaded. And I want, see this edit post page that we're on right now, that's what we're creating it on. Um, I want to send the user back to the search page only when the job posts creator uh, is not the current user, right? Because if I didn't create this job post, I should not be on this edit post page. So there's a condition on this action. So as soon as the page is loaded, and the current user is not the creator, we need to kick them out. If they happen to land on this page accidentally, we don't want them to stay on the page. So I'm going to refresh the page here. I was going to use a login logout example, but uh, really the point is to show you the, the value of conditions. Uh, so if I go to post C and all of these were uh, all of these first ones I created manually, so they have no creator, so it should kick me out. So if I click on post C, and it's probably, see how it took me back? It didn't even get to the other page because there was um, another, there was that redirect back over here. Um, as kind of more obvious example, instead of going back to the search page, let's take us back to the, I don't know, 404 page. This is the page that that uh, you don't necessarily need to create workflows for, but um, anytime someone lands on a, on a path in your URL that doesn't exist, you'll be automatically redirected to the 404. But for this example, let's say I click on post A, and it's not even going to get to the post edit page. You can see that it took me to this 404 page, which I have some other random things on here. So that's number one. That is a good example of how to protect pages that only specific people need to access, but also to demonstrate um, an example of a condition. 
Okay, now if I did create that specific job post, then this condition would not pass and I would not get redirected and I would be allowed to stay on the page. Another example of conditions are um, can be found on elements. Well, actually, uh, just real quick again, with conditions in your workflows, you can have conditions at the action level and also at the element or at the event level. So the, the actual trigger uh, part of the workflow, if there's a condition here that if it doesn't get met, none of the actions within it would run. But you can also have conditional actions so that maybe some would run, some wouldn't, you know, some would get skipped and go to the next one. Um, so different options, lots of different com combinations of things that you can do through conditions. And it's essentially, you know, when something is true, um, then this action or this event will be allowed to run. If it does not match, if it does not meet the condition, then it is not true and it will not run. So the same thing you can do, you can add conditions on elements. There's a separate tab here in the property editor. Uh, the, this is the one that I wanted to show you was if I create another condition here, when this text, so this element here is hovered, then I want to change uh, one of its properties. I want to make it underlined. Okay, so I will check this box. You can see all of the different properties that can be changed. It's usually appearance properties. Um, some properties uh, have to do with behavior. For example, I can make the text not clickable. Um, but in my example, we're going to do an underline. And I can also preview what the condition will be. You can see there it gets underlined if I turn it off and on. You can see the preview turn on and on. This is not uh, a, an activate the condition. It's just a preview for you. So I'm going to refresh my, or I'm going to go back to my search page. And see here, I'm underlining now. It's a little bit more obvious that these are actually clickable when I hover over them. You can do so many things with element conditions. You can change the colors of things. You know, I can have the color of the entire row um, highlight in some color as I'm hovering over it to make it more obvious. Um, you can hide elements. So for example, if someone is logged out, here's a good example for the logout. Uh, when, let me remove that. Let me group this input and this button together. I'm gonna right click group these. Okay, so now these are both in a group. So I can put a condition on the group and say when the current user is logged out, or in other words, isn't logged in, then maybe I want to hide the group because I don't want logged out people to be creating posts, right? So the property that I'm changing is its visibility property. So I select that, I will leave this unchecked because by default, this group you can see here, this element is visible on page load. By default, it is visible. But once this condition is met, then it's not going to be visible and it'll be hidden. Uh, so I'm currently logged in as someone. So I need to give myself a quick log out button. I'm going to add a button to the left here. Log out. All right, so I'll start edit workflow on that button. And I'm going to run the account action of log the user out. Okay, and I'll stay on the page. I won't redirect anywhere. I'm going to refresh the page, but just so you can see, as soon as I log myself out, that condition will kick in. I will no longer see this group that contains this input and this button, all right? So here we go. So I'll click on this button and there it went away. Now I'm logged out. And you can also see that my email went away too because I'm not logged in. It doesn't have an email address to pull to pull from. I would probably also do something like, you know, change this button to a login button or hide the logout button so that I can show a login button, lots of different things. So conditions, very, very powerful. They let you create like lots of alternate paths in your workflows um, and also change the behavior of your elements on your page um, so that you don't have to create, you know, uh, like copies and copies of things for every single environment. You can use conditions to change them. Super, super helpful. Now, grouping data. This is um, a feature that I want to share with you because a lot of people who build apps on Bubble are building tools for their own businesses and like custom, custom ways to create 
um, reports, different types of dashboards. It's a really very powerful tool that lets you aggregate data. Um, so this is great for business applications. Anytime you want to have a chart of some kind, um, this will let you perform calculations on your data uh, so that you don't have to build out so much or, or save so much extra information just to get you know a chart to work. Bubble will actually do some aggregation work for you and calculations for you um, so that you can see your data in, in lots of different ways. So um, here are a couple examples. I'll just kind of read through them and talk through them. And then I'm going to show you um, how you would use this function. So um, I'm going to do an example of grouping a list of invoice records by their payment status. So if you have a draft status, uh, paid or pending or overdue, whatever it might be, um, I will create a chart so that you can see that uh, all of those records fill in this chart grouped by their status. Um, other ways you would use this, just kind of different examples within apps. Let's talk about our job application app again. Uh, you could group for the company a list of all applications by the submission date so that they can see, oh, um, on this Monday, January, whatever, we had 10 applications. On the next Friday, we had 20 applications. Just kind of as a way to monitor the you know, incoming submissions, things like that. Uh, you can group by a number of different types of fields. So it doesn't have to be like a text, like a category name. It can also be by date. It can be by other things in your database. So for example, if we had an invoice type, that was linked to a client, which is maybe a user type or, or even a client type just on its own. You can group these invoices by that custom type. So it doesn't have to be a generic field. Um, and overall, this is just a great way to display stats and stuff. So let's do um, an example here. Um, actually, because, yeah, yeah, let's do an example with the invoices. I think that'll be easier. So I'm gonna create a new type called invoice. And let's do um, amount, because I'm going to show you something that we can do in addition to grouping these things, we can also perform some uh, calculations. Uh, so amount will be number, and we'll do status, which will be a text. And let's just have those two. We could obviously add other things, um, like who the invoice belongs to, and descriptions, and things like that. But I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of invoices here. Let's just do 100 paid and we'll do 200 paid, another 100 unpaid, or we'll say draft. And 500 overdue. 300 overdue. Feel free to speed through this part of the video. <laughs> uh, and then we'll do one unpaid of, I don't know, a thousand. All right, so we have two paid, one draft, two overdue, and one unpaid. All right, so let me go. I'm just going to scroll down on my search page since I've just kind of got everything here. And I'm going to install, if I don't have it already, the chart plugin. So Bubble has a huge plugin marketplace, plugins that are built by Bubble and also by other Bubble users. Um, and you know, there, it really extends a lot of functionality in your app, a lot of different additional elements to give you different functionality, very, very um, useful. So there is a chart plugin that Bubble has created that will work well for this. Okay, so once I've installed that plugin, it will become available to me on my list here, line var chart. So I'm just going to add that to the page. Okay, so for this particular example, I'm going to do um, let's do a let's do a pie chart. The type of data is going to be my invoices. Okay, and I'm going to, the data source is where we use this grouping function because the group by function um, modifies, or it doesn't modify it, it um, yeah, yeah, it modifies your, your list 
Uh, so my data source is going to be a list of invoices and the group by function will modify the list so it can um, change the way it's going to be presented to you. So data source, do a search for invoice. Okay. And this alone, let me show you what this alone will do. Let's do current. The value will be the um, status. Uh, no, sorry. The value will be the amount because uh, that needs to be a number. And then the label will be the status. Okay. So let's preview this. Okay, so you can see what with the source of it being just a full list of all of your invoices, there's no separation really. It's just that every single piece of this pie here is each invoice. So I had um, six entries, so I have six pieces here. And you can see that my label is the status, so I have paid, paid, and the, num the amount is next to it, that's the value. So, and then I have draft, overdue, overdue, one paid. So this isn't the best way to display this data. I wanna group this data so that every slice is um, uh, a different status so that I can sum what the total amount is per status. So that's where the group by function comes in. So I will select this data source and click more here. And I see I have different operators. I'm going to go down to the grouping operator. Okay, so now Bubble is asking me, what do I want to group these invoices by? So I'm going to add a new grouping. And I want to group it by status. And then this is uh, an exact uh, grouping. If you were to group by numbers, it actually gives you more options. So you can group by buckets, so like one through five or, or individual, or if you're grouping by date, it'll allow you to group by the day or by the month. Um, with a text value, it's always gonna be just, it's gonna group by the exact match. Um, and then I'm gonna create a new aggregation. So the aggregation lets me perform some kind of a math function on a number value within each invoice. So I want to sum the num the amounts within each group. So the result of this expression here is I'm no longer going to have a list of invoices, but instead a list of groups. And each group will have um, will, will be a group with under a status. So each group will be a different status. And then there will also be um, an aggregation associated with each group. And that aggregation will be the sum of the amount for each group, okay? So the value expression here is going to be, the, the value is gonna be the sum. And, you know, I can format this so that it actually looks like a currency. We'll do two decimals and the dollar sign. Uh, oh, actually, it's not gonna let me do that because that will convert it to a text. So uh, we actually want to number or format the number down here. This is kind of a separate area so that the value can remain a number uh, and Bubble knows that it's a number. So I'm gonna do that formatting down here instead. Okay, great. And then the label will be that status. Okay, so now I will refresh the page and we'll see what this looks like. Okay, so see how I have less slices here. I have my unpaid slice, which is my biggest one because it's the highest amount. Um, I have draft, overdue, and paid. So I have grouped my invoices in this way. If I wanted to change the aggregation, I could maybe, maybe instead of knowing what the sum of the amount is, maybe I just want to count how many invoices are in each status grouping. So that's a different type of aggregation. Um, and so now I have this different uh, uh, split of the pie and I still have my currency formatting. Let me undo that here. This should just be a number because we're just counting. So the, num the number value is just the number of invoices per status. So under overdue, I have two, underpaid, I have two, and I have one for unpaid and draft, okay? So this is very, very powerful. You can do so many more things with this, but I just wanted to show you that, you know, if you're building some kind of a business tool or any kind of financial application or anything that needs charts, um, stats, analytics, this is a very powerful function. 
Great. So there are a number of um, additional features um, to Bubble that I want you to be aware of that really, really contribute to building custom apps that uh, just so that you know that it's possible in Bubble too. The first is um, user roles. So I touched on a little bit kind of creating conditions based on whether people were logged in or logged out, um, but you can actually, Bubble has a whole feature for creating um, privacy rules and, and um, restrictions and permissions uh, so that based on uh, who your user is, not just whether they're logged in or out, but if their email is a certain email or if they are um, a paying user or if they're an admin or if they're any kind of custom thing you define, there is an entire place for you to create custom permission roles um, for security and have that reflect all throughout your application. It allows you to restrict access to the database in certain ways. Um, users can maybe view some of the fields uh, when you're displaying the data back, or maybe they can't find something they're not allowed to find in searches. Um, this is a global privacy um, uh, setting that uh, really allows you to create you know, more sophisticated apps with strong layers of security. So user roles, definitely a thing that you can do in Bubble. Um, the second I wanna talk about is um, APIs. So if you're not familiar with APIs, this is basically a system that allows you to connect your application with the outside world. Um, you, if you, you, you might not know it, but you're constantly using applications and sites online that are connecting via API to other things all the time. Um, a really, um, a couple of examples are, you know, if you sign up or log into some service with your Facebook account, um, that's using, that's an API connection. That service has connected to Facebook via API. Um, if you're familiar with, um, flight aggregator services like kayak.com or um, Google flights where you search flights and it shows you results from various airlines all in one, that is definitely an API connection because the searching site that you're using or even like hotel bookings where they just kind of put everything together, the site that you're searching on is connecting via API to all of these external companies and services so that they're all collected into one. So you can actually do that with your app too. You can have your app communicate with some external service via API. This is absolutely possible. And APIs are actually one of my favorite features of Bubble because it makes you uh, create, or it lets you create really, really powerful stuff. Um, it's, it's so cool. Um, not only can you connect to connect your app to an outside service to pull in, you know, data from that outside service, like maybe a calendar, Google calendar events into your app. Um, but you can actually do the opposite. You can have the outside services connect to your app so that they can read your data um, or run workflows in your application. Uh, you could build multiple apps and have them connect to each other and, you know, kind of communicate that way. Uh, Another kind of internal use of APIs, because your app has uh, API um, functionality just on its own within it. Uh, another use case of that would be to schedule things, to schedule workflows to run in your application on some recurring basis, or just in general, you can schedule things to happen in the future. Um, in other words, you don't, users don't have to be present for things to happen. Like if you wanted to send a daily email reminder for something, um, or if you're building like an auctioning website and you need to have things change their status from active listing to expired listing on a specific date and time, you can make that happen. That's actually using uh, your own internal API uh, for your app. So very, very, very powerful and very possible. The third thing I just want to touch on is the way your application is structured is you have two environments. You have a test environment and a live environment. So the testing, uh, which is otherwise known as your development um, environment, is uh, where you build everything. That's where um, everything is changed. You create the pages, you edit everything, you add, you design everything, you build your database. 
Um, and then you have your the live version of your application. So that's the published version. You you deploy your development um, environment to live. And it's just very important to, to understand that these are two separate environments that actually have two separate databases. You have a test database and a live database. It's fantastic for development because if you're, you know, say you have, you've gone live with your app and you have people using it, and you're still working on it. Maybe you're building out new features or you're just, you know, fixing bugs or, or responding to customer requests and you want to do new things. You can continue working and updating the app and leave the live environment alone and nobody will get interrupted until you deploy those new changes. So there's a really great system for controlling these environments and publishing. Um, you also have a version control system if you ever need to revert back to a previous version, you can absolutely do that. So uh, there's a, a handful of tools that let you manage all of this stuff. Um, and also for troubleshooting, Bubble also helps you test your own application in a number of ways. Um, I'm going to go back into the editor here. I showed you before there was an issue checker that showed up there. Um, let me go back to the index here. And let's say that I, you know, did not provide the email address here. So I've now created an issue. Uh, Bubble helps you, and there are lots of different things that can generate an issue. Bubble helps you identify them very quickly by putting them in this list. And if I were on some, and uh, if if I were on some other page, let's say if I'm on, you know, this page here, and I click on this issue, Bubble will actually take me to back to that page and point out exactly where the issue is. It's so helpful, um, especially if you've got a, a, you know, kind of a growing list here. Um, another tool that Bubble gives you is, let's see if I preview this. I'm going to add it manually here. Oh, no, here we go. So whenever you preview, Bubble will automatically add um, a debugger. So this is a, a, a testing tool that lets you um, inspect everything that's happening on your page and also let you break down your workflow as it's running in real time um, on the page. So let me change this back to email address and run this again with the debugger so you can see what I mean. So it's this toolbar at the very bottom here. Uh, this only shows if you are if you have the debugger on like that. So when I click on inspect, and then I can hover over one, some of my elements here and I can click on it and it will actually break down all of the different properties for that element. The reason you would want this, you know, what, you know, you might be asking, what's, how is this different from just looking at the input in your editor? Well, when you're running the page, um, you might have conditions that might be activated or not activated. You might have multiple conditions um, that might change things. And when you're previewing it, you might not be aware that a condition is kicking in or not. Um, this helps you like really inspect why things are be, are presenting the way they are in the in the preview mode um, because it might be different from just your editor. Uh, this is what your users are going to see. So if you're seeing weird behavior, this inspection tool will let you see exactly what's going on. Um, so I can see, for example, uh, you know, this input is focused right now. I have the cursor in there and it's highlighted in blue like that. So I can see why, why it's highlighted in blue. It's because the input is focused. Um, now, if I run, try to run the workflow, I'm going to get a bunch of errors because I don't have anything I don't have, a, you know, the email is required, so it's going to stop me there. Um, if I do step by step here, I can run the workflow in a step by step mode. It will pause at every action and any action that has input values, you can see here, it will show me what's being inserted. Again, this is something you wouldn't be able to see in your editor area. You would have to see it in this mode. So I can see, why did I get that error? I thought I typed in something. Maybe it, you know, there's a placeholder that makes it look like I typed something in. But if I run it here and it's telling me, no, it's actually empty. And I can click here and it'll take me to the value that was programmed to be inserted there. And I can say, okay, yeah, the input email address is value is supposed to go in there. And if I click value, it shows me that it's empty. So that actually gives me a direction to go in to 
find the issue and troubleshoot the issue. Very, very powerful tool um, for debugging um, and your issue checker as well. So where do you go from here? If you're looking to build an application on Bubble or if you have already started. So the what we've gone through in this video are, it's, it's really the core functionality pieces you need to understand, be aware of when you're building because everything that I talked about, um, no matter what type of application, you're gonna be using it. You're most likely going to be adding users or registering users to your applications. So you need to know how to sign them up. You're definitely gonna be building some kind of a database for something. You need to create data types, you need to create fields. When you have a database, you need to create workflows to add records and modify records in your database. Um, understanding how to troubleshoot your app, understanding how to pass data from one page to another, understanding how to manipulate your elements and your workflows with conditions. These are all basic foundational things that no matter what type of application you are building, you need to understand how those things work. Um, and there's obviously so much more that um, we didn't cover here today that can be done. I, I really do want to emphasize that this is just this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's so much more customization that you can build into um, these pages in your application. I want to um, let you know that there are other resources um, that go over other features that show you more specific tutorials on how to do things, um, and everything is going to be linked below. Uh, the, the I have other YouTube lessons that talk about um, very specific things, how to build uh, specific features. Um, I also send out email tutorials to my email list, which you can join if you haven't already on coachingnocodeapps.com. Uh, I do have a course on APIs specifically, because that's a whole thing on its own um, in my API video bundle, which you can also check out on my site. Um, I also offer a full-fledged course on building apps on Bubble. I go from A to Z, I show you everything you need to know. I go into very detailed explanations of how all the elements work, what all the properties are of everything, how to use these things. And not only that, but like, what's the best way to use these things? Because I want you to build your app as best as you possibly can. So my fast track course um, is all about that. It really takes you through, it's a video course, self-paced, um, and you can learn more about it on my site as well. Um, another great resource is the Bubble Community Forum. Lots of great help there from people who are experienced in Bubble. Uh, I'm on there all the time, I'm very active in the forum, answering questions. Um, it's a great place to learn too, uh, just kind of learning from other people's um, uh, questions, just things that they run into. Um, you can learn a lot from that alone. So please comment below. Let me know what type of application you're building. I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, all of the ideas that are out there. And I really appreciate you joining and watching this video. Thanks so much.